Good evening, Pacifica family and distinguished guests. My name is Bree Clark. I'm a senior here at Pacifica, and it is my privilege to welcome you all to tonight's TGC lecture event, led by the accomplished Dr. William N. Bowden. At Pacifica, we seek to understand history and truth in all subjects by learning about people and ideas that came before us, and then sharing and discussing those ideas to deepen our own understandings. This is why we are here tonight. The Great Conversation is an invitation to partake in what we do at Pacifica every day in the pursuit of truth and thinking and living well. In my first class of US history this year, as we were going over our summer reading, we discussed a, book from, we discussed a quote from the book Land of Hope. It speaks to why understanding history is not just important, but fundamental in sustaining a free society. The quote reads, historical consciousness is to civilized society what memory is to individual identity. Without memory and without the stories by which our memories are carried forward, we cannot say who or what we are. Without them, our life and thoughts dissolve into a meaningless, unrelated rush of events. Without them, we cannot do the most human of things. We cannot learn, use language, pass on knowledge, raise children, establish rules of conduct, engage in science, or dwell harmoniously in society. Without them, we cannot govern ourselves. Ronald Reagan was a strong believer and defender of self-government, along with the American ideas of democracy, human rights, and religious freedom. His White House was faced with several global threats and crises, such as the emergence of global terrorism, wars in the Middle East, the rise of Japan, and of course, the Cold War standoff with the Soviet Union. However, through his faith in God and American ideals, Reagan was able to expand worldwide democracy, globalization, free trade, religious freedom, and at last bring about a peaceful end to the Cold War. As Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for our children to do the same. Reagan fought for and protected freedom. Now it's our turn to do the same. Tonight, we are fortunate to be joined by Dr. Bowden. He's the executive director for the Clements Center of National Security, a professor of public policy and history at the University of Texas at Austin, and he formerly worked as a policymaker, which included senior positions with the State Department and the National Security Council. He's also a distinguished scholar for the Strauss Center of International Security and Law, an associate for the National Intelligence Council, and serves on the CIA's Historical Advisory Panel and State Department's Historical Advisory Committee. He has exhaustive knowledge and fresh insights on Reagan and his presidency, and case in his book, The Peacemaker, from which he'll share his remarks tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. William M. Bowden. Well, thank you, uh, David and Bree, for those very kind and overly generous uh, remarks. I especially appreciate, by the way, the, um, the qu quote you read from uh, Land of Hope, that wonderful textbook. The author, Bill McClay, is a longtime friend of mine going back a quarter century, and, uh, and the importance of history for preserving our civilization, uh, for preserving our values, is certainly a central theme of uh, my, my own life and work, too. So I just really appreciate hearing that. And uh, it's... Uh, um, Wonderful to be here tonight. I didn't realize that I'm the first time second speaker in the, the great conversation. Uh, I, I guess it was uh, seven years ago that I uh, was, was first here with you all. It's so wonderful to see how Pacifica has continued to grow and flourish since then. Uh, I'm not just a fan of your school. In a lot of ways, I'm a fellow traveler as the father of two kids who are in a classical Christian school in Austin, Texas. Um, so we're all in this shared enterprise together. Uh, and I also was realizing that uh, when I was last here some seven years ago, I was in the very early stages of of the research that became this book. Um, so who knows where I'll be seven years from now, but uh, please bring me back. Uh, so anyway, uh, maybe I'll have something interesting to say, maybe not. Um. All right, uh, yeah, before we dive into the conversation with, uh, with Board Chairman Keith Carlson, I uh, just want to give you a little bit of background on how and why I put this book together and then set the scene uh, that President Reagan in inherited, and then we'll talk about what his uh, policies actually were. I wrote this book as a narrative. Partly because I think narrative history is uh, more interesting, more readable, more accessible. That's why we like history. We like stories more than just dry facts and figures and names and, and reciting all of those. But there's two other reasons why I wrote it as a narrative which are very important to understanding the message and themes of the book. The first is, even though Reagan's struggle uh, to defeat the Soviet Union, the Cold War, is the central theme of it, as you heard Bree say when her, in her very good summary, um, 
there were a lot of other issues that President Reagan was dealing with at the same time. And here's where I draw on some of my own time as a you know, lower level policymaker in the White House, realizing that presidents never have the luxury of uh, focusing on only one thing at a time. So even though while the Cold War was Reagan's central goal, every single day he had dozens, hundreds of difficult decisions cascading into the Oval Office. Uh, Henry Kissinger once, uh, w- once said that by the time a decision reached the president's desk in the Oval Office, it's never an easy decision, right? You let the White House interns handle the easy decisions. The moderate decisions you let the mid-level staff handle. Right? It's only the hard ones that reach the Oval Office. And so any given day, President Reagan is dealing with very difficult trade tensions with Japan, uh, the latest mischief that the congressional Democrats are up to, more American hostages being taken in the Middle East, uh, ter- ter- uh, ter- terrorist strikes against America uh, and, 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 our, and our allies, um, uh, as well as uh, these very difficult decisions with the Cold War, knowing that quite literally the fate of the world hangs on the decisions he's making. Um, and that is not an exaggeration. When I say quite literal, it's because you know some of us here in the room are old enough to remember it. The nuclear balance, the nuclear standoff was absolutely terrifying. And so I wrote it as a narrative because I want readers to be able to see all the different issues and challenges and decisions cascading in at the same time uh, for President Reagan as he and his team. And they weren't always such a good team, right? He had very capable people working for him. They all loved him. They all loved America. They mostly did not like each other, right? And so this, you know, the, the feuding, the leaking, the... Um, the visions within the administration are also part of the story. But there's an even more important reason I wrote it as a narrative, and this is where I think writing it, uh, you know, now that we're, you know, 30, uh, you know, three, four decades removed from the peaceful end of the Cold War, and we're all speak a little personally as a, uh, as a professor uh, and, and uh, what I hear from my students, I worry that in recent years, a mentality is creeping in, apologies to young people here who are born after the Cold War, but even among some of us who live the Cold War, a mentality is creeping in that of course the peaceful end of the Cold War would, was inevitable. Of course the Soviet Union was decrepit and was gonna collapse. Of course there's no chance the world would have gone up in, uh, in a, in a nu- to be destroyed in, in a nuclear holocaust. Um, Reagan was just kind of lucky. He was just kind of there, the right, guy, the right guy at the right time when all this happened. We know now that between the structural factors that were eroding these things and then, you know, thankfully Gorbachev being uh, more prudent than his predecessors, that it was just inevitable that the Soviet Union would collapse and the Cold War would end peacefully. That is not true. And I wanted to write this as a narrative to, uh, to put readers in, this, in, in President Reagan's seat, if you will, in the seats of the policymakers, and to see history as it was unfolding to them in real time. Because every morning during his eight years as president that he would go into his desk at the, at the Resolute Desk in the Oval Office, even though he was confident in his strategy, and rightfully so, he didn't really know if this would be his last day on Earth or the last day the United States would exist on Earth. Uh, he did not know for sure that the Soviet Union was going to collapse and that this was going to end peacefully. And most experts at the time, and we'll, you know, Keith and I can talk about this more in the conversation, thought that the Soviet Union was strong and stable and durable and it was going to last in, into perpetuity. Uh, and so uh, I, I, you know, part of writing history as a narrative, as an unfolding story, is to remind us of the contingency of history, that it is not just... Uh, governed by these structural forces that are impersonal and, and dictating how our lives work, that individual leadership matters, that values and choices matter, that people can make a difference. And that's why I wrote this book about one particular man who made a tremendous difference. Now, just a little bit more on the situation that he inherited uh, to show what a difficult hand it was. Um, the 1970s were an awful decade for the United States and for the world. When Reagan is, uh, takes the oath of office on January 20th, 1981, here's what the previous decade had looked like. Here's what the world situation looked like. First, the United States had lost the first war in our history in Vietnam. Just the last American combat troop had left Vietnam eight years almost to the day uh, before President Reagan was sworn into office. So Vietnam was not history. It was yesterday, right? And 59,000 Americans had died. It had been deeply divisive for our country. The communists had won just uh, just even just just six years earlier. Uh, And so the the, the military was underfunded and demoralized and weakened from uh, Vietnam. The nation was demoralized from it. And it had made America look like a weak and vulnerable and divided nation to the rest of the world. And the Soviet Union had taken advantage of that. So just in the previous eight years after South Vietnam fell to communism, Laos, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Angola, Nicaragua, Grenada, Afghanistan, all taken over by communists, all in violent revolutions. These were not free and fair elections where people are voting in communists or you know, whatever their version of Bernie Sanders was, sorry. Um, uh, 
if you were taking a tally of the Cold War, just doing an objective tabulation, who's winning, who's losing in January of 1981, the communists were winning. The Soviet Union was winning, and it wasn't even close. The Soviet Union in January of 1981 had the world's strongest, largest, most dominant military. Uh, certainly, they had the largest, largest nuclear force, uh, and and it seemed that their proxies across the globe were uh, were, uh, were were advancing, and uh, and the free world was was losing. But it's even worse at home. The United the American economy was into you know the fourth or fifth year of this awful recession. Unemployment was really high, and uh, inflation was really high. The misery index was this new indicator that had been developed just to show how bad it was. And people thought that capitalism, that free markets, are just over. It's a it's a relic of history. They don't work because our economy has been in this funk for years. Uh, the uh, the American um, uh, energy industry w was a mess. We were producing very little of our own oil and gas. We were dependent on Middle Eastern oil and gas, and then. With the OPEC oil embargo, the Middle Eastern countries had shut it all off. And so some of you may be here old enough to remember uh, hours-long, miles-long lines at gas stations, right? So America couldn't even fuel our own cars, let alone fuel our economy. It's terrible for our economy, but it made us look weak because we were weak. Then, of course, 1979, the Iranian Revolution. Uh, uh, not, not only this radical terrorist uh, regime takes over in, in Iran, but they take 52 American diplomats and spies hostage and hold them hostage for the next year and a half. Again, further symbolizing America's ineptitude, vulnerability, weakness. The Soviet Union, of course, had invaded Afghanistan in December of 1979, uh, you know, feeling like they can get, get away with this because America won't do anything, anything in, in response. And finally, it seemed even the presidency itself was broken. Our general rule of thumb for a successful presidency is, you know, can a president be reelected and serve out two full terms? Right? There's more to it than that, but that's a general uh, starting point. Um, uh, the last two-term president had been Eisenhower. 20 years earlier. Since then, five successive American presidents had failed to complete two terms. Kennedy, killed by an assassin. LBJ, foregoes re-election, driven from office in humiliation over the quagmire in Vietnam. Nixon, forced to resign over the Watergate scandal. Ford, defeated for re-election after just two and a half years. Carter, just defeated by Reagan. Thank goodness, right? But still, there's a sense among a lot of the American people, the presidency itself is broken. We can't restore our country, we can't restore our standing in the world until we restore the office of the chief executive. So this is the situation that President Reagan inherits when he takes office in January of 1981. And for people who look back and think, well, of course, it was time for the economic cycles to, to, to work and the American economy restored. Of course, the Soviets were more, more vulnerable than, than we realized. Very few people saw that time. It was not seen as possible at the time. This, again, is why leadership and values matter. Um, but we can look back in hindsight and see, oh, they, they certainly worked wonderfully. But most of his critics at the time didn't think so. Finally, on the Soviet, the Soviet Union itself and the, and, the, and the Cold War standoff itself, every previous president, Democrats and Republicans before Reagan in the Cold War, had seen the Cold War as primarily a standoff between two powerful countries, the United States on one side and the Soviet Union on the other side, a great power contest, as we put it in international relations theory. Oh, and it happens to be between two rival political systems. One's a democracy, and the other is a communist dictatorship. And so every previous president, none of them had liked the Soviet Union, none of them had really wanted to surrender to the Soviet Union, but none of them, all, they all saw the Soviet Union as a, a challenge to be managed, it's there, it's not going away. There's no notion that the Soviet Union could actually be defeated. It was just seen as, like I said, a permanent part of the geopolitical landscape that needs to be contained and managed. And Reagan reverses that. He sees the Cold War as primarily a battle of ideas. And the Soviet Union is not a rival power to be contained and managed. It is a vile idea to be defeated. And again, in hindsight, he was exactly right. But this was seen as crazy, reckless, uh, destabilizing, foolhardy at, at, at the time. Where is he getting these notions? And he put it very clearly. You know, he, even though he had a much more sophisticated mind and engagement with ideas than, than is commonly appreciated, he also was a great communicator. He could put things in these pithy aphorisms. And he had said you know, during the campaign, uh, which he would often repeat, you know, my theory of the Cold War is we win, they lose. Well, he got that exactly right. But again, that is not just a, a cheap taunt or a bumper sticker. That, that, there's a very sophisticated strategy embedded in there. And what was that strategy? He saw the Soviet Union accurately as this unique combination of strong and weak. 
It was at the apex of its military might. This is why we needed to do our own military buildup to deter the Soviets from invading any more countries or certainly from attacking the United States. So he was very clear-eyed uh, about the very potent military threat that the Soviets uh, posed. But unlike most experts who thought the Soviet economy was, was, was durable and, and would keep moving along and that the Soviet people were happy in their system, Reagan saw the Soviet system as weak and, and decrepit and very vulnerable. He knew it couldn't even feed its own people. He knew that it uh, was obsessed with controlling its own people. He knew that it was afraid of its own people. That's why it put so many resources into being a police state and imprisoning Christians and Jews and any political dissidents. And so he believed that if the United States could lure the Soviet Union into an arms race, if we could do our own military buildup to, defer, to, to, to de deter them from any further military advances, but also to put those strains on their economy, that if, we'd call, if we could tell the truth about who they were, an evil empire, Empire, you know, one that has imprisoned uh, people behind the Iron Curtain, that Marxism, Leninism would end up on the ash heap of history, that if we could speak those truths about, about what they were um, and bring this pressure to them uh, on, on all fronts while still extending the hand of diplomacy. This is important too. He's committed to winning the Cold War, but he's committed to keeping the Cold War cold. Right? He does not want it to turn into a hot war where we all get destroyed in a nuclear holocaust. It, it takes incredibly deft statesmanship and statecraft to do something like that, to raise the stakes, to escalate, to increase the pressure, to back the Soviet Union to the corner while still extending the hand of diplomacy uh, and, and outreach and saying, let's bring this to a peaceful, uh, peaceful end, even while we're trying to collapse your system. So that is the situation he inherited. That is the strategy he pursued. I think he succeeded wonderfully. And Keith, let's talk a little bit more about what that meant. So, thanks, Will. Um, let's. Uh, why don't we do something unusual, and we'll we'll start at the beginning, and then at the end we'll go to the end, and we'll. F yeah. so that, that sound like a workable. So we we always have to start with the cover, the peacemaker. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you chose that title. Um, tell us where that comes from. I also know, uh, you know, it seems that uh, it's connected a little bit to the epigraph in the, in the opening pages. H how did you choose that of all the things you could have um, titled this great, this great work on, on Ronald Reagan, The Peacemaker? Mm -hmm. yeah. Where did that come from? So uh, it, it, the title didn't come to me until I'd been working on the book for about five years. All right? So these things are uh, evolving processes. I'd, I'll tell you a few other titles I'd played with. Um, uh, but it, um, there's a number of strands that feed into it. First, President Reagan's strategy was very clear, peace through strength, right? And we, we rightly uh, appreciate the strength role, but he was also committed to bringing peace to the world. He just didn't see the American military and American, um, American strength as the biggest threat to peace in the world. He saw the Soviet Union as the biggest threat to peace in the world, right? Um, but still, he was very committed to peace. And uh, we see that in his, his diary entries. We see it um, in his, even his early campaign speeches and, and throughout his presidency. And you know, I can give you lots of footnotes on that if you want. Um, so, uh, so that's where I, and it took me a while to fully appreciate the, really the, the importance of peace to him. And yet it's peace very much on terms favorable to the United States and favorable to, um, favorable to, the, to the free world. But then uh, if you get a chance to read the, uh, the epilogue, you'll see there's two particular moments where the word peacemaker is invoked, I think, in very powerful ways. The first is President Reagan's uh, final public remarks, the, final, the last public remarks he ever made uh, in, in his life on foreign policy. This is December of 1992. He's been out of office for four years. He goes to Oxford to give a, an address at the Oxford Union, uh, surveying the peaceful end of the Cold War and yet some of the emergent challenges of the 1990s. And he's worried that the United States and the free world might um, retreat back into isolationism uh, and, uh, and America might pull back from our responsibilities for international leadership. And so he closes his, his remarks uh, saying uh, that the, the work of freedom is never done and the task of the peacemaker is never complete. And it was a few months after that that he's diagnosed with Alzheimer's and then doesn't make any more public statements on foreign policy. So those, I closed the book with that. Like those were his final words to us. But one more place where peacemaker comes. Uh, 12 years after that, 2004, June of 2004, President Reagan dies. And his uh, casket is lying in state in the Capitol Rotunda in the uh, in, in Washington D.C. Uh, I was in Washington at, at the time. You know the the lines to pay tribute to him were miles long. Americans coming from all over the country to pay tribute to our, our great leader. Uh, and the second day that his casket is lying in state, a surprise visitor flies in from Moscow. It's Mikhail Gorbachev, 
Um, and he's, of course, ushered to the front of the line. And it's a very moving scene. You can, you can see it on, on, on YouTube. Gorbachev goes up to the casket. He kind of bows his head, and he, he strokes it. Um, and he spends a couple minutes there paying silent tribute to his rival, but also his, his great friend. And as Gorbachev is walking away, a CBS News reporter uh, comes up to him and says, well, you know, thank you for coming. What, what did you think of President Reagan? And Gorbachev says, he was my friend, and he became a great peacemaker. Uh, and so that's, I thought, if Gorbachev can call him a peacemaker, my book can call him a peacemaker. Yeah. That's right, thanks. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, if I remember right, uh, living through those years, um, the normal moniker was warmonger. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he only deployed uh, troops aggressively on, on one, one instance in the, in the eight years. Mm -hmm. So his reputation as being the warmonger is, is incorrect, both in his own estimation and understanding, the historical record of his deployments, but also his chief, his chief rival. It, it yeah. How, how did how did they get it so wrong? So yeah, and this is where you know one reason why I wrote this book is I realize there's still you know so many myths, especially on the left and caricatures about about President Reagan that I wanted to I think you know set set a lot of the story straight. Uh, and so he uh, you know some might see this as a contradiction. I see it as wonderfully aligned. Uh, he saw a key role of American military power is, is certainly protecting the country, deterring any aggression by our adversaries, but also to strengthen our diplomacy. And again, he wanted to bring the Cold War to a peaceful end. He didn't want it to turn into a shooting war, but he knew that he would be a much more effective negotiator with Gorbachev or whatever other Soviet leader he was dealing with if when they're sitting across from the negotiating table, as Keith and I are sitting across here right now, if it wasn't just words they're exchanging, but if that Soviet leader knew that the American president was backed up by the strongest, most powerful military in the world. Uh, that is a great leavening factor, if you will, on anything that they're negotiating over. Uh, and, and, and one final thing, though, on, on the, I think the genius of the American experiment here, President Reagan's strategy was not just to outbuild and outspend the Soviets. Sure, we needed to increase our defense spending substantially after the horrible cuts of the 1970s and how demoralized our troops were and still using 1950s uh, weapons and uh, everything. Uh, and Reagan believed that the Soviet economy was vulnerable and that they couldn't keep up in, in an arms race. He had a great phrase. He said, the Soviets loved the arms race when they were the only ones running in it. Um, <laughs> so, and he wanted to put the United States. But remember, it was, his strategy was not just to out, uh, outspend and outbuild the Soviets, it was to outsmart them. And I don't just mean at the negotiating table. If you look in, you know, I won't go into all the details here, but defense policy specialists, see me afterwards. Um, if you look at the types of weapon systems that President Reagan supported and invested in uh, uh, in, in his military buildup, they were designed to be so much qualitatively better than anything the Soviets had, that no matter how many more rubles the Soviets would throw at their tanks or their missiles or their planes, that kind of stuff, they couldn't keep pace with American technology, American innovation, American in ingenuity. And I'm here in an you know, audience in California California. Remember, he'd been the governor of California for two terms. And in the 1960s and, and 70s, when Silicon Valley had first had its first initial boom. So he's very familiar with uh, America's world, uh, you know, world leadership in technology and innovation. He wanted to harness that for his defense buildup so that uh, American weapons, even if we only have one for every 10 that the Soviets have, would be so much better that they, that they had no chance, uh, no chance to compete with us and would have to be forced to negotiate from a posture of weakness. Yeah, and I mean, for the parents in the room, a lot of uh, high school students and parents of students, it's it's uh, it's one thing to negotiate with your adversary, the teenager, mm -hmm. but it's another if you can say, "I will take the phone away." I mean, that's that's, <laughs> that's peace through strength okay. is what he was <laughs> right. he was doing. I, the yeah. other aspect of the peacemaker, uh, I wanted to touch on and get your thoughts on, and I was really struck by the diary entries mm -hmm. that you quote uh, quite uh, quite a bit from in in this great work. Um, that's drawing uh, directly from his own reading of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And I don't think in the popular narrative of, of Reagan, um, just how uh, deep uh, and, and, and deeply read in the Scriptures uh, he was and how that affected his domestic and foreign policy. A and I will say, um, uh, when I was uh, much younger, uh, Amy and I uh, would attend church uh, with Ronald Reagan, as you remember, uh, from, from years and years ago. And even uh, in the midst of his illness, he was extremely regular mm -hmm. uh, come Sunday morning. And so I got to witness that uh, firsthand. But not until I read your book did I see how much the, his reading of, um, of the New Testament in particular uh, 
influenced his thinking on how he was going to approach foreign policy and most likely had for many, many years. Can you, can you give us some insights on where he was coming from uh, from a faith perspective and how he translated that into his role I- as president? Sure, yes. And this was one of the uh, surprising revelations of my research and something I was quite captivated with. And of course, I should have mentioned earlier, you know, one reason he liked the phrase the peacemaker is because it comes from Christ's words in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers too. And so uh, during his eight years in the White House, uh, you know, President Reagan rarely attended church and he was often ridiculed for that. And people thought, oh, he's, you know, when he uses religious language in public, he's just, you know, doing it cynically to appeal for votes. And he doesn't really, doesn't really, really believe, believe much there. Uh, what came out over the course of my research is he was a man of very, deep and sincere Christ- Christian faith, uh, and and not just as a source of comfort, but it was very formative for his entire worldview. It's why he believed in human liberty and human dignity. It's why he had a sense of uh, living in a fallen world and the pervasiveness of original sin, and why he knew that often the task of a president is not to choose between you know an ideal option and a bad option, but between a series of bad options, right? Often in a fallen world, we only have uh, flawed and, and difficult choices. Uh, and so there's a, there's a much more well-formed Christian worldview there. But just a few examples on just how genuine his faith was. Uh, uh, and a lot of this comes from my readings of his diaries, of his private letters, you know, things which he never intended to be public, right? So this is not any political uh, posturing. Um, uh, so uh, uh, three months after he, actually just two and a half months after he takes office, uh, he is almost killed in an assassination attempt by a, a crazed gunman, John, John Hinckley Jr. And Reagan... Um, he said uh, he's minutes from death. If the bullet would have gen- been just one millimeter, you know, one direction or, or another, it would have uh, severed a main artery, and he would have uh, he would have he would have uh, would have certainly died. And as he's lying in the operating table, losing consciousness in the emergency room at George Washington Hospital, he's bleeding out. Um, he starts praying that God will save him. And then, as he later writes in his diary, he stops and he realizes. Um, he says, "I also prayed that God would forgive that troubled young man who tried to kill me." As Reagan says, I realized I can't ask God to save me if I'm going to be holding a grudge against that man. And after all, aren't we all God's lost sheep, right? Again, this is not a political speech he's giving to appeal to particular votes. Uh, This is a man with a very very deep, genuine faith. Another example, um, uh, he'd had a difficult relationship with his own father who was abusive and alcoholic. Uh, When he later married Nancy Reagan, uh, the first lady, President Reagan had become pretty good friends with her father, his father-in-law, Loyal Davis, a very rock-ribbed conservative, very distinguished physician from, from Chicago. But despite his conservatism, Loyal Davis was uh, a lifelong atheist. And in the summer of 1983, President Reagan is uh, taking a vacation at his uh, ranch here, uh, you know, just north of here in the mountains outside Santa Barbara, and he learns that his beloved father-in-law is dying. He's on the, he's, uh, on the hospital bed. He's just a few days away, away from death. And Reagan takes the time to write a 10-page handwritten letter to his father-in-law, sharing with him the Christian gospel and begging him to believe in God, to repent of his sins, to trust in Christ. He even invokes C.S. Lewis. He uses the Lord, liar, lunatic argument, saying, you know, Christ, you know, we can't just say he was a good moral teacher. Um, uh, Again, this is not the action of someone who doesn't have a, a genuine faith. Final vignette, which brings us together to, uh, to the peaceful end of the Cold War. Um, and of course, part of Reagan's strategy of delegitimizing Soviet communism, of treating it as this awful, this vile idea, is supporting the religious freedom of Christians and Jews uh, behind the Iron Curtain, uh, both because it's the right thing to do, but it also it exposes the barbarity and the, um, and the oppression of Soviet communism. And so every time he'd meet with Gorbachev in their negotiations, in addition to talking about the nuclear balance, he's asking Gorbachev to, you know, he'll give him a list of uh, religious prisoners that he wants freed from the gulag. This would drive Gorbachev crazy. Why are you meddling in our internal affairs? Why do you care about these people? But over time, they build a genuine friendship, these two rivals. And in their final summit meeting in Moscow, May of 1988, um, the Cold War is still going, but it's starting to thaw a little bit. The Soviet Union is beginning to crack apart. President Reagan knows that we're on a path to a peaceful victory. He still has some unfinished business with Gorbachev. And he spends about an hour of their summit meeting, not talking about all the policy issues uh, or the geopolitical balance, trying desperately to persuade Gorbachev to believe in God. And Reagan's just deeply grieved that this Soviet leader, who's kind of become his friend, is an atheist. He's worried about the fate of his soul. And Reagan even speaks personally about his own sadness that his son is an atheist, and he uses some different apologetics devices. 
And Gorbachev doesn't know what to make of this. You know, he, this is not what world leaders usually talk about, right? Um, but Gorbachev realizes that this is coming from a place of genuine sincerity on, 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 Re on Reagan's part. I don't know if it worked. There's no evidence that Gorbachev does finally uh, believe in God before he dies. Only God knows that. Uh, but again, uh, I think like a further demonstration of how you cannot understand President Reagan as a man, as a leader, as a great visionary strategist in the Cold War without understanding his Christian faith. Uh, Pray uh, for your enemies. Yeah. And uh, yeah. the other uh, great little story in the book is upon the death of a, a prior uh, Soviet leader, uh, Brezhnev, uh, Brezhnev yeah. right? Yeah. And um, again, he gets maybe ridiculed for not going to church too much, but I don't know how many of us who were alive in the 80s or have read about the 80s um, understood the details of how he lived out his faith mm -hmm. uh, until we open up your book. Um, but in terms of praying for your enemies, uh, tell us the story a little bit about uh, the relationship with Brezhnev to the extent there was one and, and how that ended. Yeah, so you know, Reagan had written a number of letters to Brezhnev. He was the vicious Soviet dictator through the 60s and 70s and the early 80s is the first one that Reagan uh, has, to, has to deal with as president. Uh, Gorba uh, Brezhnev would refuse to meet with Reagan personally. Um, they never had a, a summit meeting. Uh, you know, Brezhnev you know, was, like I said, an old hard, hardline Soviet. And so when he dies in November of 1982, President Reagan uh, takes the First Lady and his National Security Advisor, Bill Clark, and they go down um, 16th, uh, 16th Street in Washington, D.C., you know, just uh, several blocks from the White House. They go to the Soviet Embassy, and they go in you know, to sign the condolence book uh, for President's death. And then Reagan turns to the First Lady and his National Security Advisor and says, you think it'd be, oh, I know we're in the Soviet embassy, you think it'd be okay if we said a prayer for Brezhnev and for the Soviet people? And they say, sure. So he bows his head, says a prayer for the departed Brezhnev and for the Soviet, Soviet people. Um, sure, he's partly doing it to show the exercise of religious freedom even within the Soviet uh, embassy, but even as he detested the system that Brezhnev presided over and so much of what Brezhnev represented, there still is that genuine sense of Christian faith of praying for our enemies. That's, that's great. It's beautiful. Um, I in terms of the man and, and not just the faith, but also the combination of remarkable fortitude, endurance in the, in the midst of difficult times and, and confidence in his own view. I want to uh, fast forward just a couple of months from Brezhnev passing. Now we've got a new Soviet leader to deal with. Uh, we're in, in the Andropov. We don't Andropov, know who this guy yeah, is. We don't yeah. know what he's going to be about. But then in 1983, uh, I was I was actually overseas, so I might have missed some of the details, but I still do remember uh, uh, quite a bit of things happening. But your book brought it all back home, and again, your remarks on the narrative style are fantastic. So for those of us who have forgotten what a roller coaster this was, um, let's talk about 1983 for for a moment. Um, and you have a a false alarm that we've just uncovered, I think, and partly from your work and others. Um, where a new early missile detection system of the Soviet Union signaled to the command that the um, Americans were launching their missiles. Mm -hmm. You have less than a half an hour to react and let the political leadership know if you believe it to be true, mm -hmm. and then there the Soviets would then launch a, a, a full uh, counter-strike of ICBMs and others at our, at our shores. Um, it was a false alarm. The commanding officer at the moment thought it was a false alarm, ran a diagnostic check, and it said, nope, it's not a false alarm. This is really happening. Mm -hmm. So we were on the brink of annihilation. I any other officer might have said it, but he stuck to his convictions. Mm -hmm. Same year, a uh, Soviet pilot shoots down an unarmed passenger 747 Korean Airlines. Same year, same week. Same week. Yeah, okay, yeah, good. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Seven, uh, 747, all souls perish, um, mm -hmm. and, and the Korean Airlines, which prompts a hue and cry for retaliation. Mm -hmm. um, they, we have uh, Grenada. Mm -hmm. We have uh, communist insurgency in, in uh, with the Sandinistas uh, mm -hmm. being supported by Cuba and the Soviets. The Marine barracks. We have, yes, we have uh, our, our embassy and our Marine barracks. This is all happening in 1983. I read this and I thought, he didn't get to wake up one morning without just the biggest world crisis uh, going on right on his doorstep. How, tell us a little bit about how the man not just survives, but leads through and builds out of 1983 into 
1984 and all the successes that followed. Okay, yeah. So, well, thank you. And I can tell Keith actually did read the book. All right, so. I colored in most of the pictures, yeah. not all of them. Yes, yeah. We had our doubts back in our college days <laughs> if this guy was ever actually reading his books, but I think at least this, this one he did. So, well done. I just had Bree give me the liner notes. Okay. It was fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I actually, I know she's the one who really read the book. Right. So, um, well, anyway, for others of you here, I don't want to prove them all, but if you do get a chance to read the book, I think you'll see that 1983 is an absolutely terrifying just year. Just incredible. Yeah, it is. Um, and, uh, you know, all those years of the Cold War are terrifying. All eight years of the Reagan presidency are fraught with drama and momentous decisions. But, but 1983 is, is, is per particularly the crucible. Um, it's certainly where the world comes closest to nuclear destruction since the Cuban Missile Crisis, maybe even, uh, maybe even more, more, more so than that. But it's also the year, we can look in hindsight, when President Reagan's strategy starts to bear fruit and we start to win the Cold War. This is the turning point. Um, and it's no accident that the turning point is also the crucible when it all almost, uh, you know, almost goes up in, in the mushroom cloud. Um, this is also the year that he uh, is at his most confrontational when he calls them the, e the evil empire, for example. You know, uh, obviously a fascinating backstory on, on that speech and its, and its lar larger effects. It's also the year that he deploys several hundred American intermediate range nuclear missiles all throughout Western Europe. Uh, to counter the Soviets' deployment of their, uh, their intermediate-range nuclear missiles targeting the European capitals. And this is where... Uh, Which was applauded by all of the media yeah. and, and the, and the well, major European powers. This yeah. is a great idea, no, putting right. nuclear I mean, missiles on our, yeah, on our doorstep, right? Hundreds of, I know, yeah, hundreds of thousands of, of, of Germans and British and Dutch and others marching the streets, protesting against the, this crazy warmongering American president. Thatcher almost loses re-election over this. Um, and she holds firm because she believes believes in the alliance and she trusts President Reagan. The, the German, uh, uh, West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl, a great pro-freedom, pro-American leader, almost loses re-election over this. The Italian Prime Minister, his name I forget because they've had like 80 of them, almost loses re-election re over this. a vowel. I can't yeah, 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 that's that right. Way, yeah. So um, anyway, uh, and, uh, and meanwhile, the KGB is fomenting all these, all these protests a, against the United States, right? So it seems like the alliances are, are, are falling apart. And of course, this is the Cold War we're talking about, but as Keith mentioned, it's in the same weekend that President Reagan makes the courageous but difficult decision to invade the, um, the communist uh, island of Grenada in the Caribbean. He doesn't want the, the Soviets to get another foothold in the Caribbean like they already had in Cuba. And that same weekend that a Hezbollah terrorist uh, um, a suicide bomber attacks the Marine barracks in Beirut and kills 241 Mar American Marines. It is the worst loss of life for the, American, uh, for the, the Marine Corps in one day since Iwo Jima 40 years earlier. These happen on the same weekend. And it was the weekend before that we now know the Soviets had almost retaliated, with it, launched their entire nuclear arsenal at us because of, the, because of the false alarm. And two weeks after, they had shot down the Korean Airlines um, uh, civilian jetliner, killing 270 people, right? So uh, anyway, it is a crazy, crazy time. We should all be thankful that the, our country and the world survived it, and that we can be here tonight talking about it as, as history. Where does he get his strength to, per to persevere? Certainly his Christian faith, right? Um, uh, he believes, especially after he survives the assassination attempt, that God is guiding and sustaining him. And those of us in our you know, troubled current moments certainly know that we need to draw on the, on the, the reserves of our own faith when there's a, a world and a culture that is turning against us, much more difficult uh, even so in his time. And then because he is a man of ideas, because he sees the Cold War as a battle of ideas, because he knew that all the previous American strategies were just managing this rather than trying to win, um, and because he knew the expert opinion had been pretty wrong about the Soviet Union in a lot of different ways, he also has a certain strength in his core of saying, you know, the other strategies haven't worked before, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with mine. Again, we know in hindsight he was absolutely right to, to do so, but the pressures uh, uh, are just almost unfathomable that he was able, able to withstand. Um, and again, I hope you'll get a, a palpable sense of that from the book. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you certainly will, and um, you'll want to, uh, if you don't have one yet, there are going to be copies back there, and Dr. Ann Bowden will sign a copy for you. Um, but it is, it is a... Or for your favorite Democrat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and he, um, it, it, I, I described it over the uh, holidays as a book I could... Um, once I picked it up, I, I couldn't put it down. I just needed more time to pick it up. It is, it is really a great read. And I'd encourage you to, to get a copy back there. Um, I, I, in terms of um, learning from history, and I want to get to the historian's art uh, for maybe students who might be looking at that, some of our history teachers that are here and those who dabble uh, in it uh, just, just for fun. Um, but Reagan, I think, enjoyed it 
but he also lived it, and, and he was willing to learn from it. So I'm wondering if you could uh, shed some light on the relationships with the very few people that had ever been in his shoes mm -hmm. and how he benefited from um, learning from history and learning from his elders and, and kind of picking up the wisdom, but at the same time having the courage of his own convictions where he didn't think they had gone the right way or were not giving him good counsel. Mm -hmm. And specifically, you opened my eyes to his relationship with Eisenhower, which having studied both a fair amount, I never knew that they had and such a formative relationship I er earlier in Reagan's political days. But also then, uh, Richard Nixon, who was a bit in exile, but nevertheless was more than willing to fire off a telephone call or a long letter yeah. uh, to, to, to Reagan. Um, walk, walk us through how he could benefit from those folks that had been there before and, and kind of stand on the shoulders of giants, but to Move, move things forward uh, after those types of conversations and insights they gave him. Okay, well, uh, you know, my favorite stuff to riff on, but there's a lot there, so I'll try to condense it down. First, Reagan as a, a, a student of history. Uh, again, he's not an intellectual, he's not a history professor. Thank, thank, thank the Lord you don't want history professors in the Oval Office. Those guys are the worst. Oh, that's uh. So anyway, um, uh, but uh, he read quite a bit in the American founding. Okay, so there's a deep commitment to our founding ideals. Um, he would often quote from these in his speeches. And his formative years growing up are the 1930s and 1940s. Which any uh, you know, Pacific students here will uh, hopefully recall the Great Depression and World War II. And he would often refer back to the lessons of the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, and for him, those were, uh, if America retreats into isolationism, tyranny advances. And that had been certainly one of the things that encouraged Nazi Germany's aggression and Imperial Japan's uh, uh, aggression. Uh, this is why he's so committed to free and open trade. He thinks that protectionism is bad for the United States and bad for the free world and prolonged the Great Depression. World War II, uh, you know, certainly the lesson that you cannot appease tyranny and dictators. Uh, you know, that had been Chamberlain's great... Uh, a great mistake at, at Munich, but also the importance of allies. You know, he's a big fan of the Grand Alliance, uh, especially the United States and the United Kingdom, and and our key role as as partners in in winning World World War II there. So those are some of his takeaways from from w World War II. Um, but then he also uh, loves to learn from his predecessors. Um, uh, uh, you know, as, as Keith mentioned, you know the the last successful two-term president, let alone Republican president, had been had been Eisenhower. Uh, when Eisenhower was retired from the White House and uh, spending his uh, his winters not too far from here in uh, in Palm Springs, uh, he and, and Reagan would meet regularly. Uh, they built a friendship. They'd go golfing together. And Eisenhower was in some ways a kind of an early foreign policy mentor of sorts for him. He'd been an accomplished president, of course, the great general uh, who had you know led all, all American forces in Europe in in, in World War II. And so Eisenhower had, uh, you know, talked to Reagan about the importance of a strong economy, a strong domestic economy being a key pillar of America's international strength. He talked to him about the relationship between force and diplomacy and how the best military you can have is a strong, robust one that you never need to actually use in anger, that you never need to, need to fire a shot. Um, so he'd gotten a number of those, those principles from uh, Eisenhower. Nixon and Reagan, it's a very complicated story. I, maybe I'll do my next book on that one, right? We're having back in another seven years. Uh, but the, the highlights are this. They were fierce rivals for about 20 years who then later uh, become, become friends in, a, in an interesting way. So rivals, uh, uh, you know, both uh, born into poverty in the Midwest, both uh, uh, get fresh starts out here in the land of opportunity in California. Um, this was the 1980s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, yeah 1950s and 60s, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, and then both really come to dominate uh, Republican politics for about three or four decades, right? There's either a Nixon or a Reagan uh, on the presidential ticket, or at least running the primary in almost every election from 1952 to 1988. And you can talk about the new the asterisk there, but um, uh, and yet they have very different visions, a lot of ways. Uh, Nixon is uh, certainly does not want the Soviet Union to gain t too many advantages. He doesn't want them to win, but he sees them, again, as that problem to be managed and contained, not to be defeated. This is why Nixon adopts the detente framework of, let's let the Soviets have their sphere of influence in their half of the world, and we'll have ours over here, and we'll leave them alone if they leave us alone. Um, and Reagan found that just anathema. Uh, he thinks it was uh, is uh, conceding way too much to the Soviets. In Asia, they have their differences. Nixon looks west across the Pacific to Asia, and he sees the key to Asia is China. China. That's why he does this strategic opening in China. Reagan looks west across the Pacific to Asia, and he sees the key to Asia as Japan, the only democracy at the time in the region, um, America's valued security partner and treaty ally. And so they have their differences. When Reagan, uh, and this is a good fight in the 1976 campaign when Reagan challenges Ford and is really you know, running against the Nixon framework there. So they're, they're rivals. When, Nixon, when Reagan uh, wins the election in November of 1980, 
and is about to be sworn in as the new president of the United States, there are only three people alive on planet Earth at the time who know what it is to be president of the United States. They are um, uh, Jimmy Carter, who had just been defeated, not much to say about him, Gerald Ford, a good man, a capable president, but was not interested in staying in public life, wanted to spend more time on the golf course, and then Richard Nixon, uh, the third one, living in disgraced exile after Watergate in, in, in New York. All the others were dead. Eisenhower's dead, LBJ was dead, we can, we can go back through. And for as different as different presidents can be, uh, I'm told I've never been president, I don't plan on being one, it is a uniquely difficult job. It's the hardest job in the world. And so there is that special camaraderie among those who have held that office. And so Nixon, knowing that, uh, starts writing a series of letters to Reagan just offering his help and advice and saying, I wish nothing but your success. Your success is America's success. We've had our differences before. I know what you're going through. I'm one of the only three people on the planet who know what you're going through now. I'm at your disposal. And Reagan's very receptive to this. He doesn't hold personal grudges. He's got, a, again, part of his Christian faith. He's got a, a, a forgiving heart. He doesn't agree with everything he's getting from Nixon, but he, but he welcomes it. And over the next several years, they, they build a really interesting friendship, uh, so much so that Reagan and invites Nixon back to, to visit the White House in 1986. It's Nixon's first time being there since he left in disgrace in 1974. Um, and so it's a, it's a very powerful moment of, of reconciliation. And yet, finally, they still have their differences. Um, uh, Nixon can never fully support Reagan's unique combination of force and pressure on the Soviet Union, but also outreach to, outreach to Gorbachev. Uh, and so they don't have a bitter falling out or anything, but, but their differences over Cold War policy uh, still end up uh, preventing, I think, a, a, a full, rec uh, a, a sort of a full meeting of the minds, if you will. And, and Nixon passed uh, here locally not uh, long after those two differences were born out, and, yeah. and it looked that uh, for all the world that uh, essentially he was wrong and Re Reagan was right. Yeah. Um, he probably doesn't get full credit for that. Uh, George H.W. Bush uh, was uh, had his hand on the wheel at the time. Mm -hmm. um, the Cold War ended, and I think the popular media has largely credited Gorbachev's mm -hmm. uh, internal uh, changes to uh, al allowing for that end, and, and Reagan was also there somewhere. But it, it, it really, uh, it, it, the way history works, um, in, in having not presidents for life, you had Reagan out of office when his, the fruits came to harvest, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Bush and Gorbachev were maybe more um, credited. But I, I wonder if you could walk us through the basics of the Reagan grand strategy, mm -hmm. because when he got up there, as you alluded to earlier, uh, here, here's how it goes, uh, we win, they lose. Mm -hmm. He wasn't just beating his, thumping his chest. Mm -hmm. This wasn't just, uh, you know, fun America mm -hmm. uh, type talk. This was, no, I really think we're going to win this thing. But I'm not in a Winston Churchill-like way. I'm not going to bury my enemy. I'm going to be magnanimous in, mm -hmm. in victory and let them save face. Where does this grand strategy come from and how does it work? With the Reagan doctrine, the idea of a building of alliances, um, how did he come by that? Because nobody seemed to be talking about it in the 70s. Mm -hmm. It was all, as you mentioned, detente, and, mm -hmm. and that you stay in your corner, we'll stay in ours. Mm -hmm. They'll cheat at their treaties, we won't at ours, mm -hmm. and we just keep falling further and further behind. Where, where does this grand strategy of Reagan's and the Reagan doctrine and the ultimate uh, insight to have a successful strategy in the Cold War come from? Yeah, so uh, a lot of it is things that he'd been thinking about and studying throughout the 1960s and 70s. Again, the vast majority of my, my book, it's not a biography of him. It only focuses on his eight years as president, only foreign policy. But in the introductory chapter, you'll see I try to trace some of these threads. And, and, and we can see as early as 1963, he was saying, I think the Soviets may be more vulnerable if we put pressure on them uh, economically, militarily, but also extend the hand of diplomacy. And maybe they will see the errors of their ways and that that's a losing path. And so, uh, so you know, there was in some ways a 20 year, two decades of preparation and thinking about and studying these problems and developing the, you know, the main contours of this strategy before he, before he actually comes, comes in, into, into office. Um, but a couple things you mentioned there, which I really want to press on just how unique his, his strategy was. Um, uh, and this is where, while I wrote my book for, I hope, a, you know, a, a general audience and tried to make it very readable, I do want my fellow scholars to at least have to pay attention to it and take it seriously. And there's two debates among scholars about Reagan and the end of the Cold War. Uh, the first is, was his goal to just end it or to win it, okay? Um, and, of course, I think, you know, the, the, goal, the goal there was both. And the second debate is, 
who gets more credit for the peaceful end of the Cold War, Gorbachev or Reagan? And, you know, maybe George H.W. Bush in, in there somewhere, too. Most scholars say Gorbachev. Again, most scholars are very dismissive of Reagan. Like I said, they think he was more lucky. He just happened to be in the Oval Office at the time when this wonderful guy, Gorbachev, comes along and decides to reform the Soviet Union and, 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 and the Cold War. And uh, if I can interject, if you read Dr. Imboden's book, just about 1983, he was not lucky. No, I mean, no, it was, he was far know. from lucky. Yes, he yeah. it was actually brilliant, and you bring that out. But sorry, continue no, with your right. answer. It was not luck. So on that first part, the goal is the goal to win or to end. Um, and I, you know, I the way I summarize it is he wanted to bring the Soviet Union to a negotiated surrender. Right? So he's, he's a child of World War II. He knows that our goal in World War II, when it actually was all out hot combat, right? You know, land war in, in Asia, land war, land war in Europe, was unconditional surrender. Uh, um, and you know, no room for negotiating, as, as there wasn't with, with Hitler, with, uh, with Tojo and Imperial Japan. Reagan wants the Soviet Union to collapse. He wants it gone. He sees it as an idea to be defeated, but he wants to keep the Cold War cold. And so that's why his goal is bringing them to a surrender, but doing it through pressure and through negotiations, which is why he's always extended the hand of diplomacy as, as well. And the second part on who gets more credit, uh, him, him or Gorbachev, um, I think it's decisively Reagan, and I'll tell you why, not just because I think he had some good ideas. He takes office in January of 1981. Gorbachev doesn't come to power until March of 1985, four years and two months later. And it's now clear, and again, this is where I you know, have the benefit of, um, of doing my research at the Reagan Library when a number of uh, the previously very highly classified top secret uh, strategy memos and National Security D uh, Council documents have recently been declassified, so we can now see those. That from the beginning, in 1981, Reagan's strategy of bringing this pressure on the Soviet Union is not just to, to, to weaken it and to expose its contradictions. He's very clear he's pressuring the Soviets to produce a reformist leader that he can negotiate with. Right? Um, this is remarkable. Uh, he, and this is why I titled the chapter in my book, When Gorbachev Comes to Power, I title it Waiting, waiting for, for Gorbachev. Yeah. yeah, Waiting for Gorbachev, yeah. Because Reagan had been looking and waiting for a Gorbachev, and not just passively waiting, trying to pressure that evil, sclerotic, uh, despotic system to produce a reformist leader. And is that why he keeps hammering on human rights and the religious persecution issues, which yes. really didn't factor into helping the U.S. economy or, or third world nation? It, yeah. was, it was really internal uh, yeah. Soviet affairs, but he keeps hitting yeah. on uh, religious Yeah, the he's trying to bring pressure on, on all fronts, you know, I internally to support Soviet dissidents, uh, you know, against their own, their own system, the Soviet economy, the military. But he wants the Politburo to be so backed into a corner, so delegitimized in the eyes of their own people, uh, feeling like we've got no other way to think, all right, we've got to find a reformist leader, because the last three we've tried, Brezhnev and Andropov and Chernyko, they keep dying, and they were just these old-line Soviet troglodytes, and it just wasn't working. Um, and so, sure, Gorbachev is essential. Uh, you won't have the peaceful end of the Cold War without Gorbachev. Reagan himself would have said that. You know, that doesn't take anything away from Reagan to say that. But I want to give Reagan a lot more credit for the very fact that Gorbachev comes along in the first place. And then once he does come along, that Reagan's willing to take some of the political risk of meeting with him, of negotiating with him, of, of pursuing this diplomatic off-ramp while being unrelenting in the pressure. And this is a very, very difficult and delicate balance to achieve, and he does it masterfully. Wow. Good. Okay, we're going to come down the stretch, and then if we haven't covered any of your questions, now's a good time to start jotting them down legibly and briefly uh, so that I can read them, and then we'll get those picked up uh, um, once Will and I wrap up here. But feel free to jot down a question, and hof hopefully uh, we won't cover it right now, but I have a couple more as we wrap up uh, this portion of it. Um, he had insights. I think Eisenhower helped him here. Um, on the relationship between the domestic economy, which, as you alluded to in your opening remarks, not in good shape mm -hmm. uh, when he came to office, and he, he f was in going into headwinds for a few years, wasn't he? Um, but there's a relationship between the domestic economy and worldwide peace in America. There's a relationship between domestic policy and foreign policy. Um, if you can, uh, kind of briefly, w what does that look like, and what is his insight there that maybe predecessors and successors have, have maybe missed? Yeah. So Reagan knew that his Cold War strategy could not succeed if he did not first lead the restoration of the American economy. He knows that his own political support from the American people depends on this. He knows that the sacrifices and risks he's going to ask of the American people in the Cold War, uh, he can't ask those in good faith unless he's doing his part to help restore jobs and rising standard of living, um, 
uh, for the American people. He knows that the defense buildup uh, and modernization that he wants to preside over is not uh, feasible or sustainable if we don't have a growing economy as well. And he's also very committed to free and open trade, partly out of his own free enterprise principles. He had often say that you know tariff is just a polite word for tax uh, on the American people, and he's right about that. Uh, but also because he wants to help, uh, he believes that a rising tide lifts all boats, and he wants to help grow the economies of our allies in the free world, especially in Europe and, and in Asia. He doesn't see these as, he doesn't see economics as zero sum. He doesn't see that America's growth will have to come at the expense of our allies, but rather that if, if their economies are growing, that ours can as well. This is why, uh, again, he takes, he shows great political courage and principle in supporting and promoting free trade, uh, which is, you know, it, it feels like it's fallen into disfavor these these days, it was in tremendous disfavor in the 1980s. About the only thing most Republicans and Democrats in Congress agreed on in the 1980s is they're protectionists, right? They wanted more tariffs on Japan, on South Korea, on Taiwan, on the Europeans. Um, uh, uh, and, and in the short term, you know, there were some, uh, uh, of course, some lost American manufacturing jobs. Trade policy is complicated. But Reagan is constantly making the case to the American people in Congress saying trade wars are not the answer. We tried that in the 1930s and it doesn't work. And I want, um, I believe in American innovation innovation and competition. And if there is a level playing field, and he was committed to a level playing field, he didn't want you know, other economies taking advantage of us, he believed that the United States could compete and win, but also it would help our allied economies too. And he saw trade as one of the several bonds to forge between our allies. And he knew that if he's going to be asking our allies to take risks of growing their own defense budgets, he has a masterful uh, strategy with Japan, getting them to triple their defense spending in eight years, triple it uh, at, at you know, great uh, political risk to the Japanese leadership. Um, he knows that if we're going to be asking them to make those sacrifices of American troops being based there, of American missiles being based there, that we need to also show them our commitment to, uh, to free and open trade and, and open markets. Um, and so, yeah, for him, all these things are of a piece. His, uh, his free market convictions, his economic policy uh, cannot be understood aside from his foreign policy and vice versa. Yeah, nice. Uh, well, um, from the, this great epilogue, um, you, you have to understand, while uh, Will has had his own uh, conversion of sorts from his early view of Reagan to his now scholarly view of Reagan. He's um, talking about my high school years. Yes, so I am, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just a few few short decades ago. Um, he, um, he, he opens up the fact that uh, he has a new found appreciation for him, but the book is not just all one-sided, and you really get to f look at some of the hard decisions Reagan made um, and the cost that had on real human beings, and I think you, you kind of take them to task in a, in a number of areas. So I want to read this one section here uh, to show how balanced the book is, uh, but also I want to uh, tease something out of this uh, for going forward. The Reagan legacy is not without its bitter fruits. His policies at times included providing support to China, Sad Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Iran, jihadists in Afghanistan, all of whom would become America's adversaries in the ensuing years. We've lived downstream of that, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Um, such were the hard choices of geopolitics at the time. Strategic successes sometimes contain the seeds of future threats, just as the United States armed the Soviet Union during World War II against the common foe of Nazi Germany, only for Washington and Moscow to become adversaries afterward. So the Reagan administration's support for China and the Mujahideen may have sprung from an anti-Soviet imperative, but also had considerable downstream costs, which leads us to 9-11 and our ongoing uh, threat um, uh, with, with China and the growing rivalry. I, uh, two things there. One is, I think it is sometimes the temptation of the Christian to say, putting nuclear missiles in my, my friends' backyards to blow up millions of people, growing the, in, uh, the army, dealing with uh, third world thugs who happen to agree with me uh, on Soviet policy, but uh, that are, they're persecuting their own. But I mean, these are nasty, nasty types of decisions, and I think a lot of people wouldn't mind just fully retreating from it. Um, what's your view on the role of uh, the believer in that kind of uh, what we might call a more secular space, although R Reagan certainly applied his theology throughout. Mm -hmm. um, and also, how do we look forward with that sort of engagement that he would have had into the threats that we're looking at right now with modern Russia downstream from Reagan's Soviet Union and modern China, mm -hmm. which is almost a different China than the one Reagan was uh, pushing yeah. and pulling with. So yeah. how do you balance the tensions of the faith in these high stakes and very 
nasty sorts of arenas. Mm -hmm. And also, what do we do with that going forward as, as we head out from here to, to, to this uh, present reality we're looking at? Boy, you're not giving me anything easy tonight, Carlson. I'll tell you what. All right. Um, so, uh, um, first, I appreciate you reading that that passage from the epilogue. So again, you know, a, a user's a reader's guide to any of you who do have a chance to read this. Obviously, you've heard from my remarks tonight. This is a very, very favorable treatment of President Reagan. I think it's all deserved. But greatness does not mean infallibility, right? He had flaws. He had deep flaws. And there's not a single leader on the planet, not named Jesus Christ, who did not have considerable flaws. Um, Churchill, I'm a big fan of Churchill. He had Gallipoli. He had some terrible ideas during, during World War II about the Mediterranean Front as opposed to the Northern European, right? You know, so, um, and Reagan likewise had his. And also, I believe a responsibility as a scholar and as a Christian um, to tell the full truth. Now, I think telling the full truth in a book like this overall is a very favorable treatment. I think the truth is. But I don't do my readers or my students or, or you know, fellow scholars, uh, you know, in any service and won't help my credibility if, if it's the life of St. Ronald. It's not, right? Um, he is a human being. And also, policy making, leadership in a fallen world always entails trade offs and very difficult choices and risks and downstream effects. And I think part of the book tries to acknowledge these without faulting him saying, oh, he, if only he would have done this, this instead. It's saying there were not good decisions. And again, part of my teaching now is in a policy school. I often tell my students who want to go into policy careers, listen, um, you know, being a policymaker is, I'm not training you that you'll be presented with two choices, a good option, and a bad option, and your job is to pick the good option. Much more often, you're going to be presented with a bad option, a really bad option, and a terrible option. And your job is to pick the bad option and then to realize that picking that bad option is going to have some negative effects, and you're going to get criticized, uh, and some parts of it won't work out, and you can't necessarily know where it's all going to go. And that's what President Reagan faced constantly, right? And, and so do our wives. I mean, quite uh, well, frankly, well, it's, uh, it's a different, uh, well, different book. Okay, okay, yeah. no, uh, okay all right. Um, um, no softballs tonight. No okay. softballs. All right. So, uh, so, so, so again, uh, you know, when it comes to deciding to support some of these pretty brutal right-wing military governments in Latin America or, or Asia, he knew how bad they were. He knew that during World War II, we had to provide billions of dollars in aid to the Soviet Union because uh, that's what it took to defeat Nazi Germany. And similarly, a number of these trade-offs uh, had, had, to, had to be made during, during the Cold War. And so that's where I think his, uh, his Christian faith, uh, he's almost an Augustinian in some ways of understanding that we live in this fallen world uh, you know, a utopia is not possible, withdrawal is not possible, and you have to always ask yourself, what is the alternative? And for him, certainly a number of times the alternative was, okay, if we don't do this, then communism will advance further, and communism responsible in the 20th century for the deaths of 100 million innocent civilians. It's the most ghastly, barbaric system known in human history. Uh, and so he was, that's what enabled him to make these trade-offs uh, without necessarily being, being blind to there are some real downstream effects and costs. Okay, well, we got a few questions. If there's more, please uh, find one of the Pacifica students and have them send it up. Mm -hmm. well, we got a few on China. I, I think you covered that uh, pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm going to move to a couple of others. One, I hadn't heard this before, but maybe you uncovered this during any of your research. Is it true that President Reagan thank you, had any sort of uh, mentoring or kind of uh, on the down low relationship with economist Milton Friedman? Mm -hmm. And what impact would that have had on the success of his presidency? Uh, mm. The economics of Friedman uh, impacting uh, the Reagan economy. Yes. Any truth to that? Yeah, so there is something to that. And again, I don't know the full story here um, because I you know, don't do as much in the book on economic policy. But while he was governor of California, he met a few times with, uh, with Professor Friedman. He read a couple of his books. He read a number of articles. Um, and he certainly gets, you know, in part some of his free market convictions from there. But interestingly, one of the big takeaways he took from Friedman was the importance of uh, sound currency and monetary policy, even more than, than, uh, than, than fiscal policy. And this is why Reagan, w during his first couple years as president, was supportive of the Fed's high interest rates to rein in inflation, right? And it, it cost him tremendously politically with the American people, cost him with our allies for some complicated international e economic reasons. But partly because as a, um, you know, certainly a protege of sorts of Friedman, he knew that unless we can restore real value to the dollar and, and stop this run runaway inflation, uh, any other short-term economic recovery from the tax cuts and deregulation just won't be sustainable. Mm, okay, good. Uh, another, um, a couple quick ones. Th these are both going to be related. Um, did Reagan trust the CIA, first of all? Mm -hmm. Secondly... Do you think Iran Contra was an uh, intelligence community attempt to take him down? Hmm. And you spend a lot of time on Iran Contra and the really the black the black eye of the presidency. Yeah. Uh, 
what, what are, you, what are yeah. your thoughts on his relationship with the intelligence community and, and any involvement there with Iran-Contra? Yeah. So Reagan has a very complicated relationship with the CIA. Um, when he becomes president, the CIA is very demoralized from the Carter years uh, and their dreadful uh, CIA director, uh, Stansfield Turner, under, under Carter. They were particularly handcuffed in their covert action and in their spying, you know, efforts to steal secrets, like we'd lost most of our spies behind the Iron Curtain. And so in picking Bill Casey as a CIA director, uh, a devout Catholic, and a very fierce Cold Warrior, Reagan really wants to empower the operations arm of the CIA to do covert action, to steal secrets again, to get back into the business of espionage. And he fully supports them, and they become pretty effective at that. CIA also plays a key role in the Reagan doctrine of supporting anti-communist fighters in other countries. Uh, so supporting them to do kind of our, their, their fighting rather than sending, sending American troops. Uh, less so with CIA analysts. The other business of intelligence, of course, is doing analysis of world conditions. And he's getting a lot of analyses from the CIA that are telling him the Soviet economy is pretty strong, it's pretty durable, and they can keep, keep going, and that uh, he just doesn't believe it. And he, he's right not to have believed it. CIA wasn't engaged in any subterfuge here or anything of like that. They were just following the conventional academic wisdom. They were making the mistake of actually trusting the, the economic figures the Kremlin was putting out. We now know the Kremlin was just making these up, right? You know, they didn't even know what their own economy was doing. Um, and so that's where Reagan starts, you know, he's not waging war on the CIA or anything like that, but, uh, but s uh, trusting them less um, and following his own instincts and values more. And interestingly, another he becomes his own intelligence officer, anytime he's able to um, uh, support a Soviet dissident getting freed from the gulag and then welcoming them as refugees to the United States, he loves to meet with them in the Oval Office and hear their story, but also ask them, what's it like in the Soviet Union? What do people think of the leadership? What's the economy like? And so he's getting a report from the CIA saying, well, the Soviet economy is going to grow another 2% this year. It's not super efficient. It's keeping it along. And he's hearing from these recent Soviet political prisoners, people wait for hours in the bread lines. We can't feed our own people. Uh, our economy is a mess. Everyone shows up to their jobs, but they don't do any real work, and, they don't, you know, and the Soviets pretend to pay us for work that we, we, we pretend to do. And he's thinking, okay, if ordinary people are telling me that this economy is just a fiction in a basket case, how can I trust these numbers I'm getting from the experts in the CIA. Not, not to mention they had that problem you bring out in the book with their postal system because of the stamps. They no. had that real tr <laughs> trouble with the stamps. Uh, what was going on so there? A joke, I, a joke that Reagan uh, lo loved to tell um, is that the uh, Soviet stamps issued with their dictator Andropov on them uh, just, just weren't working. And it's because people were licking the wrong side. They were on the licking <laughs> the wrong side. So anyway, so he had a, uh, he had he had great sense of obviously humor, Obviously right? so, ma so many of it, so many of, uh, so many of his, his, his great jokes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and and so one of the questions here, I think, draws in that kind of Iran warmth. Oh, Iran Contra. Yeah. Iran -Contra. Tell, tell us very more about Very briefly on yeah, Iran Contra. I, very complicated scandal. Uh, you know, have me back in seven years. I'll give you a few hours on it. Okay, but but you know, in brief, it involves selling American arms to Iran in hopes that they will free American hostages. Okay. And then diverting some of the funds from those arms sales to support the anti-communist Contra fighters in Nicaragua because Congress had cut off funding for them. Um, uh, and None of which w is what we would call particularly legal, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 and both, w both of which were against the law. Here's what I'll, what I'll first say. Um, is it is the only scandal I've come across in American presidential history, and I study this stuff for a living, where the main actors do everything they do out of pure motives. Okay? Um, every other presidential scandal, it's maybe about sex, you know, Clinton and Lewinsky. It's about trying to defeat your political enemies, Nixon and Watergate. It's about enriching yourself, the Teapot Dome scandal under Harding, right? You know, for uh, more, more venal motives, if you will, of ill gotten gains or concupiscence or, or political corruption. <coughs> Excuse me. The motives in Iran Contra are twofold. One, it's get American hostages freed. I support that, right? That's a good motive. And the second is support these courageous anti-communist fighters who are trying to defend the freedom of their country against the communist dictators in Nicaragua. I support that too. So Reagan's not getting rich off this or, you know, the no, no, the no ill motives. That said, it is foolish and illegal. Uh, part of it is he is misled by his advisors. Uh, part of it is he's going against some of his own values and, and better, better instincts about not negotiating with, uh, with, host with terrorists and hostage takers. He actually, I'm convinced he doesn't know about the diversion of the funds to the Contras. That's done by a couple of rogue staff. But as president, as Truman said, the buck stops here. He's, he's still responsible for that. So I try to explain and give context for the scandal here so people can understand it. Well, not exonerating. It, it is, uh, I think, a, a real uh, dark spot on, on his presidency. He very nearly gets impeached uh, over it. 
it, uh, it, you know, it almost break, breaks the presidency. But again, going back to what I was saying about greatness does not mean infallibility, it humanizes him, and it makes his recovery all the more remarkable. Okay, so, you know, one of his great iconic moments is June 12th, 1987, standing at the Brandenburg Gate, dividing East, communist East Berlin from free West Berlin, and saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And that in itself is a remarkable story, a remarkable backstory to that. He, sa- he gives that speech when his approval rating is about 30%, and most Americans still don't trust him from, from Iran-Contra. He, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a weakened president. He's almost losing his grip on the presidency there. Uh, and yet, he still has the inner strength to press forward with his Cold War strategy, to speak the truth about the depredations of, of Soviet communism and its imprisonment of the people of, uh, of, of East Germany. Uh, and that helps galvanize his recovery. And so it, 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 that makes that speech all the more notable knowing that all the pressures against him uh, and, uh, and the near collapse of his presidency from that scandal to go back there and give it. Um, one uh, question on what we learned from Reagan go looking forward, uh, I'll combine two, and then also domestically, uh, we'll break it down to domestic and foreign. Mm-hmm. On the foreign side, uh, the question has to do with China now has a lot greater access to technology, economy, mm-hmm. uh, our, our institutions, they're funding a lot of them, they're... Um, uh, than maybe the Soviet Union did. Um, what do you think his Reagan's approach would be to this latest and, and morphed communist threat? The communist threat of CCP I- is different than uh, the USSR. Yeah. Uh, related, moving the globe halfway around, in your opinion, what do you think his response to the current war uh, with Russia and the Ukraine or Russia and its fear of the West uh, would be based on his his worldview. So how uh, well, how would he tackle these real current issues? Yeah. And then I'll get to the domestic one to close this yeah. up. I'll give you a short answer and then a yeah. slightly uh, uh, longer one. The short answer is I don't know. Uh, and I have to be honest about that. I, I was telling a couple of you earlier, I never met President Reagan personally. Uh, he died almost 20 years ago. He left office almo- almost 40 years ago. Um, the world was different then than it is now. Uh, no one can really know what he would do right now if he happened to be president. Okay, so that's the, the honest first answer. That said, I do have some speculations and some thoughts. Happy to share these. Um, uh, and while there are differences between our, our, our contest, our competition, our conflict with China now than the Soviet Union then, we've got more economic in it, in, in entanglements. There's not a Warsaw Pact. The nuclear balance is different. You know, I can go into all those. There is more fundamental sameness, and that's why I am actually comfortable as a shorthand saying we are in a new Cold War, especially with China. Uh, And what I can say is President Reagan's strategic principles toward the Soviet Union, a few of them that I think would be relevant today, first, get the theory of the case right. Uh, for him, the theory of the case for the, the Cold, Cold War was it's a battle of ideas and we need to defeat the idea of Soviet communism. Uh, I think we've lost a lot of the sense of the real battle of ideas with Chinese communism. It is not the pure command economy that Soviet communism was, but it still is you know, state-run authoritarianism and it still is a fundamentally Leninist uh, political structure uh, committed to preserving dictatorship at home and exporting it abroad. And so getting that theory of the case right, understand it's not just they're big and powerful and we're big and powerful and then you know we're going to bump up against each other, uh, that it is a battle of ideas. Second, um, deep commitment to allies. Uh, again, this is, I didn't say as much about it, but so fundamental to, to Reagan's worldview. He sees our allies as a unique source of American strength. Uh, it's, a, it's an asymmetric advantage that we have over the Soviets then and that we have over China now. Um, and so uh, 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 doubling down our commitment to our allies. Third, supporting voices inside that country for freedom, whether it's the Soviet Union then or, or dissidents, uh, uh, in, you know, house church Christians, uh, uh, other religious dissidents, Uyghur Muslims in China now. They are some of our natural allies. They want American support. And Xi Jinping is afraid of the United States, but there's one thing he's more afraid of than the United States, and that's his own people. And if you look at the billions, maybe even trillions of dollars that he spends on internal surveillance, on controlling everything his people can think and say and see and do. Um, That shows a real vulnerability. You don't do that if you're not afraid of your own people. So let's support them. Let's give him something more to be afraid of. And then finally, on the defense balance. Uh, Again, take a page from the Reagan playbook. Let's outsmart the Chinese military, leveraging American technology, rather than just trying to outbuild them. Nice, okay. Oh, and then on the Kremlin, I'll just say this. Sorry. The Reagan doctrine was predicated. He doesn't want American boys fighting overseas wars. He doesn't want another Vietnam. So instead, what do you do? When a country is threatened by Russian aggression, you send arms to the people fighting against it for their own freedom. Yeah.
okay, uh, domestically as, as we close. And then if you'd like, we, we want you to pick up a, uh, one of the books, and uh, Dr. Imboden can sign that for you over there uh, as we conclude. Um, but before, uh, we've had two very different presidents the last two terms. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we can all agree on that, right? Okay. Um, comparing you the don't say. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm glad you were sitting down to hear that. Yeah. Uh, comparing the state of the presidency Reagan inherited to failed, if not mediocre, presidency and a, and a completely disastrous end to a, a presidency before that. Um, you, you cataloged it in your opening talk. The presidency that he inherited, what are your general thoughts about the state of the office of the presidency and how it's changed, maybe because of Reagan? Mm -hmm. um, and the second, the second one in these lines, what are the lessons uh, you think we should be learning from Reagan and his approach to his political enemies, domestic mm -hmm. uh, and, and foreign, uh, that we can apply to those that we're at odds with politically today? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Cocktails with Tip O'Neill, maybe. You okay, know, yeah. all right. right. So, yeah, on, on the first part, boy, the state of the presidency as an institution then as now. Um, it's in a bad sp spot now. You know, I, you know, if I were to say otherwise, you'd laugh me off the stage, right? Um, that said, just as a matter of history, I actually think the institution of the presidency was in worse shape when Reagan inherited it than it is today. And I'm not saying it's not in really bad shape today. And nor am I saying that it's inevitable that it can be recovered and restored today, by the way. Just as uh, I you know, hope you heard in my intro remarks, it was not inevitable that it would be restored and strengthened in his day. Um, it takes a unique combination, and may God be merciful on us in giving us this, of an inspired, courageous, principled leader, and then American people who are willing to get behind that, uh, too. Um, and so that's the, the first part. On Reagan's treatment of his uh, political adversaries, um, he was a ruthless competitor. He wanted to win. He believed in the principles he was advocating for. Uh, he fought hard on the campaign trail. He fought hard when he was negotiating with Congress, uh, when he was debating with his, uh, you know, his, his political opponents, whether it's Carter in 1980 or Mondale in 1984. But he fought fair. And he did not see his political opponents as enemies to be hated, but just you know, misinformed people with the wrong sets of ideas, and he wanted to defeat those ideas. Um, and uh, and this is why uh, this is why he was able to build you know some genuine friendships with his real political adversaries. Just one little anecdote on this that I think is kind of touching. Like I, I personally have very, hold Ted Kennedy in very low regard. All right, for any number you know, going back to Chappaquiddick or his bad policies. Right, there. I hope I'm not stepping in toes here. I hold him in very low regard. Reagan didn't care much for him either. But in 1982. Uh, remember, Ted Kennedy's two brothers, uh, JFK and RFK, had both been assassinated. Uh, and a tr uh, you know, so Ted Kennedy's the only surviving uh, Ken Kennedy brother, now a you know, liberal Democrat in the Senate who's opposing Reagan's policies at, at every turn. In 1982, Ted Kennedy and then Jackie Kennedy, JFK's widow, come to President Reagan and they say, Mr. President, as you know, there's a tradition that as a president is leaving office, his big donors will support him in raising money for a presidential library. These are all privately funded. Got the Nixon Library here in Yorba Linda, the Reagan Library up the way in Simi Valley, all funded by pri private donors. Um, and they said, uh, JF, because JFK was taken from us by an assassin's bullet, he was never able to raise that kind of money. And so we've got the, you know, the Kennedy Library up there in, 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 in Boston, but it's really underfunded, it's really struggling, uh, and we just can't raise the money for it. Would you be willing to help us? And President Reagan says, absolutely, because I want to honor the institution of the presidency. I want to honor one of my forebears, JFK. I want to do something for bipartisanship in our country. And so he travels up to Boston, and he taps his own fundraising network, and he presides over like a 500-person dinner that raises something like you know, 30 or $40 million, which you know that's a rounding error for Carl the Carlson Law Firm, but that was real money back in 1982, right? Uh, for the Kennedy Library. Um, uh, as a gesture of goodwill, and uh, and Ted Kennedy and the Kennedy family, you know, they never forgot that. That that meant that meant wor the world to them. And again, it's hard to think of a an American president these days of one party doing that for a, a deceased rival of of another party. So that's what I mean about those gestures of friendship and reconciliation, while still staying firm on the principles that you disagree with. I thought when you were going to give us an anecdote about Ted Kennedy, it would find uh, two two young bucks in in, in a Ford F one fifty giving. Senator Pell arrived, oh, okay. <laughs> arrived in 1996 from uh, the, the, the Senate to uh, what is now Reagan uh, International Airport when he uh, regaled us with stories of his partnership of sorts with, with, with Ted Kennedy. And we learned a lesson that day many years ago that um, 
you can agree with someone politically but don't particularly like them personally and you can really disagree with someone politically and be be fast friends we we learned a lot from a, a liberal I, uh, uh, a line of the of the senate six terms who came in with jack kennedy when jack kennedy was like a president we were given a, a guy a ride to the airport who was elected senator back then and he really uh, kind of uh, shared some insights on how you can reach across the aisle for these for these sorts of friendships. Um, I still get a lot of mileage out of that story. That's a, yeah. It's a good one. I'm glad we. Afterwards, I'm glad we fun. pulled over and gave him yeah. a, gave him a lift. Yeah. Um, a, a, as we wrap, uh, and it brings us back to the end where I said we'd be. There is Gorbachev uh, in the viewing line at uh, in, in the Capitol, and then um, I believe if I have the order right, they brought him from there to Simi Valley. Uh, for a viewing on the West Coast, and for those of you that were around, uh, you know, then you'll remember there was a line that was about 13, 14 hours long, and, and my wife and I uh, had the good fortune of being able to cut most of it mm -hmm. uh, because of a position I held at the time and was invited right up. The person who cut us, um, so there's always someone bigger, you know, um, the person who cut us was, was Senator John Kerry, mm -hmm. who was no Reagan fan, uh, he was in the midst of running uh, for the presidency. Oh, that's right. It's June of 2004. It was yeah, June of 2004, w. Bush, and yeah. he was out in California on a fundraising thing, and then he under he learned uh, that Reagan uh, would be there for a viewing at the Reagan Library, and he pulled uh, right in front of us to pay his respects. But I think some of that Reagan ability to um, disagree with the ideas but still appreciate and love the person across the aisle uh, rubbed off. And, and so there, there was uh, Senator Kerry coming to pay his respects as Gorbachev has paid his respects. I mean, politically, both domestically uh, as well as internationally, he didn't burn those types of bridges. He was indeed a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. And I think you've just captured this so beautifully in this book. I, I really thank you for the hard work. I mean, decades mm -hmm. uh, as a historian to pull this together that we could appreciate. Um, I'd encourage you to get a copy on Amazon or right here and then uh, say hello to Dr. Enbone. He'll be at the back table here in just a moment. Uh, if you want to pick up your own copy or get your copy signed, he'll be there. But can we all uh, thank uh, Will Enbone for his time and, and work? Thank you. All right, that was okay. awesome. Thank you. Well